Welcome. You are about to view a recorded talk of the Mathematical Consciousness Science online seminar series held in 2020. This seminar series aims to explore the role of mathematics in the scientific study of consciousness and hopes to connect researchers who have an interest in this topic. While every session of the seminar consists of a talk and discussions, the latter are not recorded and the following will only contain the talk. We hope you will enjoy it. For further information, please visit our website, seminar.math-consciousness.org. My name is Ryota Kanai. I'm based in Tokyo, running a company called Araya. Uh, it's an AI startup, but, but, but some of you may know that I used to be an academic scientist, especially uh, working with neuroimaging and consciousness. So, um, so today I want to talk, you know, of course, about consciousness and uh, give uh, my current thoughts uh, on some computational perspective, and especially uh, in the functional aspect of consciousness. So it's going to be a lot of speculations, um, but, but, but the idea is to provide like, new ideas about how to approach consciousness, which I, I think is you know, probably one of the like, themes uh, in this series. So, uh, oops, there's, okay. Um, so there are three parts. So uh, I want to give a, like, a brief intro to problems of consciousness uh, in the uh, maybe like first uh, five minutes or so. And then uh, uh, there will be two main parts. The so first part, or uh, number two here, is uh, called information closure theory of consciousness. Um, so it's an information theoretic approach to consciousness uh, proposed by Asa Chan, uh, who is uh, working in my company, Araya. And also uh, he uh, used to uh, work with me and Anil Sass at Sussex. And so, and then for the last part, I want to connect uh, consciousness to general intelligence. But, but this part will be a lot of speculations. So I, I think this would make a nice discussion material. All right, so, uh, okay, let's uh, start from the problems of consciousness. So um, I want to introduce five uh, main problems of consciousness. And I, I, well, for the first problem, I picked the hard problem consciousness. Pro probably many of you already know what the hard problem is. But roughly speaking, uh, the question is, why does subject subjective experience occur at all? So when we think about uh, the process that gives rise to experience of seeing, uh, in terms of physical world, uh, light is reflected by some object we are seeing, and then light reaches the uh, back of the retina, and then the signal is somehow converted to uh, electrochemical signals, which finally reaches the brain. And so we know there's a lot of information processing happening, but uh, and eventually you know, we can recognize what kind of object we are seeing, but the question is, why we have subjective experience of seeing the object at all. So the, this is a like, really mysterious uh, problem because you know, from our current knowledge of physics, it seems uh, it's sufficient to describe all the physical interactions uh, without uh, involving any subjective experience. But, uh, but, but from our like subjective uh, conscious mind, it, uh, there is like really clear experience. So why is this happening? And so, so this seems to be a like really difficult uh, problem for science. And I, I guess uh, like a lot of consciousness researchers are uh, like originally intrigued by this question, but, but I want to introduce other problems as more concrete problems we can potentially solve. So the second problem is what we call the boundary problem of consciousness. So the question is, what determines the boundary between different consciousnesses? So, so for example, like, you know, between different brains uh, across uh, different individuals, uh, we can communicate uh, through language or other means, but, uh, but, 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 but we seem to have like, separate consciousness. So, so there's clear, clearly a boundary between uh, individual consciousness and but also inside the same brain uh, not the whole brain uh, give rise to consciousness but only part of the brain seems to 
uh, be involved in our consciousness. So, so but then, uh, so what what determines this boundary? So that's a, a oh, like a real problem that we should be able to solve scientifically. And the third problem is uh, something we call the scale problem. So we know uh, some activities in the brain uh, correspond to our conscious experience, but um, but we don't seem to be able to access every event happening inside the brain. So for example, like, you know, like when, you know, when you uh, hear uh, like electrophysiological recording of the like single neurons, there are a lot of neurons firing almost randomly, but, but we, we don't know all those uh, in spikes. Um, but, but, but what we experience consciously is something more stable. And so, so in that sense, you know, we don't seem to use information represented at the level of single neurons or subcellular level. And so, so there is seems to be like the right scale uh, where the information corresponds to the content of our conscious experience. But but then the question is, uh, so what is the scale? And and then is there anything special about that scale, uh, which? Um, corresponds to consciousness. So, so this, no, I, I think this kind of problem has been recognized, but, but, but we don't seem to have a uh, like systematic way to approach this uh, question. And the, the fourth problem is uh, the function of consciousness. So when we think about uh, the hard problem, uh, we don't, we tend to assume uh, consciousness may not have direct uh, causal impact on the physical system. In that sense, we often uh, neglect potential functions of consciousness. But on the other hand, when we consider evolution of many creatures, uh, so we, we wonder whether consciousness played any functional role. So what kind of uh, functions are uh, achieved by having consciousness in biological systems. So that's, uh, again, uh, a difficult question, but, uh, but I think this, uh, this should be also answered. And uh, the fifth problem is uh, about the existence of consciousness. So uh, and I think this is particularly uh, relevant for uh, the theoretical approaches to consciousness. So uh, can we prove consciousness in machines like AI or aliens. So, so a lot of uh, like theories of consciousness uh, tend to uh, assume that you know, the consciousness we talk about is about uh, our, like, our biological brain's uh, consciousness. But, uh, but in order for a theory uh, to be like a, like a real theory of consciousness, I, th I think that theory needs to be able to make predictions about uh, the presence of conscious experience inside machines or inside creatures that we don't understand. So, but in a way, you know, this uh, problem is uh, also related to the first problem, which is the heart problem. Yeah, so, but, so in, in some sense, like all these, uh, Questions are uh, related to each other, but uh, but but I uh, listed this uh, because you know probably uh, for problem number two, three, and four, uh, we we could have potentially more like productive uh, like research directions uh, which uh, we tended to ignore. So so that's why I wanted to highlight all uh, these. Problems, but of course, you know there are potentially also other problems I didn't mention. But uh, so, so this is uh, not a, like a real comprehensive list of problems we should solve. But I just wanted to uh, like introduce some of the problems um, I want to discuss in the context of the theories I'm going to talk about today. Okay, so uh, so now I move on to information closure theory. So yeah, so. So first, I want to explain the motivation behind uh, building this theory. And so the first, so this comes from uh, two observations and the uh, paradox. So the first observation is uh, our conscious 
consciousness uh, seems to be limited uh, both in terms of space and time. Uh, so, so, so this statement is related to the scale problem of consciousness and the boundary problem of consciousness. So, so no, as I introduced uh, those uh, problems, uh, what we have access to from the inside of conscious mind uh, seems to be very limited. So we don't have access to micro scale information or uh, like, uh, or like, you know, even like a bigger scale information. And also we don't have access to all the information outside the brain. So, and not even inside uh, the body. So for example, we don't seem to have uh, direct access to the information on the retina. So, so in that sense, uh, our information, like our ability to access information is like limited. So, so that's one thing. Uh, and then but for the second part, uh, although, uh, so observation one suggests our like ability to access the information is very limited. So in that sense, uh, we do not have direct access to the world, but uh, still our, the content of our consciousness seems to reflect uh, what's happening in the external world. So combined these two observations together, there seems to be some sort of paradox. So the first part, observation one, suggests consciousness is informationally closed from the external world. But at the same time, observation two suggests consciousness contains information of the world. How is this possible? And so, but from this uh, paradox, uh, uh, to solve this paradox, I want to introduce something called non-trivial information closure. Uh, this is a, a like really neat concept to capture this kind of situation. So, so, so now I introduce uh, this concept, NPIC. So, so first I want to uh, formally define what it means to be informationally closed. So here I'm assuming, uh, let's see, okay, so E, is the environment and why it's a system. So maybe this could be the brain or cell or something. So, but we assume that the world is split between the environment and, and some agent. And so for this agent to be informationally closed from the environment. So basically we assume transfer entropy from the environment to the agent is zero. So, so this is the definition of transfer entropy from environment to the system. And so you can also write it this way. And so if uh, the system S is information closed, then this transfer entropy is zero. And, but, um, but if the system is just uh, independent from the environment, so there, if there's no mutual information, uh, so this transfer entropy is trivially zero. So, so that's a very boring situation. So, so basically, okay, it's informationally closed, but, but then the system, internal system doesn't have the information of the environment. So we want to have some mutual information between the system and the environment. So, so now that corresponds to observation two, which I mentioned earlier. So, but two, make this mutual information greater than zero, then this second term needs to be positive. So if we want to like, keep this transfer entropy zero. And so, so NTIC is just defined uh, as these terms. So, so this is a definition of uh, non-trivial information closure. So basically that's the, uh, the self-predictive information uh, minus, uh, oh, okay, let me go to the next slide. So, so uh, I'm just uh, showing the same uh, NTIC definition. And so, so there are two ways to express this NTIC. So 
probably like this one might be uh, easier. So, so the first term corresponds to uh, mutual information uh, between the environment and the system. But the, the second one is the transfer entropy from the uh, environment to the system. So what we want to have here is if we want to increase NTIC, uh, we want the system to have the information about the environment. So we want this mutual information to be high, but, but we want to have a like, small transfer entropy from environment to uh, the system. So, so to achieve this, so basically you need to have a, a system that has an internal dynamics that uh, kind of develops like the environment. So, so th this internal system needs to become a uh, like good model of the environment. Okay, so that's the uh, sort of semantics of this uh, definition. Okay, so now we defined NTIC and the, the core of our claim of information closure theory is a process, uh, NTIC process is uh, conscious. And so, but, but this is just more formal definition of something we call C process. So basically we start from uh, dynamics of the whole universe X and, and then the universe is split into some system and the environment. And so Y is a coarse graining of S or, and also of course another coarse graining of X. And if Y is NTIC to the environment, uh, this is called uh, a C process. So, so that's you know, kind of like formal definition, but, 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 so, but what we you now just want to uh, define here is uh, basically we want to have a coarse graining of the system which is uh, has information about the environment. So, so that's uh, the kind of process we are assuming. And so here by having this kind of coarse graining element, so uh, this system uh, has the information of micro systems um, as well. So, so, you, so, so this could be kind of seen as a, like a good coarse grained variables which can uh, make prediction of itself. So, so now, you know, now we get, so we, we can use this concept of NTIC uh, to sort of uh, uh, like define a scale that's kind of independent from micro scale. And so, Okay, but, but, but to state the uh, information closure theory uh, more explicitly, uh, the idea is uh, a C process, or so basically NTIC process, uh, is conscious, and then the content of consciousness corresponds to the state of this process, and the level of consciousness corresponds to the amount of NTIC. You know, so so that, at least you know, that's our working hypothesis. Yeah, so as I said, uh, so with this kind of definition, uh, you know, we expect to see, uh, you know, we should be able to uh, compute NTIC for many different uh, scales of coarse graining and then find a scale that's a maximum uh, you know, for NTIC. So, so that way, like we, you know, we can try to find the right uh, scale of information representation uh, that has maximum amount of consciousness. So, so that's, uh, that's the way like we aim to address the scale problem. Okay, and if we consider uh, uh, this uh, information closure theory, uh, we can also uh, sort of qualitatively explain why reflexive behavior doesn't re give rise to consciousness. So for, for example, uh, you know, we can consider uh, some sort of stimulus coming from the environment that sort of completely determines the internal state. And so if this directly determines this uh, future system state, then 
uh, this is kind of detached from its own past state. So in that sense, uh, it loses this uh, like self-predictive information. And yeah, and then this uh, like state directory determines the like future. Uh, so so this part is action. So so that's that's uh, so when you consider like this kind of stimulus that directory determines the internal state that sh should break the NTIC and then therefore uh, this process doesn't give rise to consciousness. So that's the idea. And and also uh, that we can make a similar uh, argument uh, for prediction error. So 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 this uh, this part is uh, like work in progress. But uh, but once we have some like NTIC process uh, which is generating consciousness, but um, but if uh, there's a prediction error that should generate transfer entropy, which is a second term in NTIC, and then uh, uh, NTIC values should briefly uh, decrease, and then uh, again the consciousness must be uh, suspended. So, so I think this is an uh, like interesting prediction made by uh, uh, information closure theory. Yeah, and so, yeah, uh, so, so next I want to ask um, how like this NTIC is related to uh, so inference. So, so as I said, uh, the internal dynamics need to become like the environment to increase NTIC. So, so it needs to learn the sort of dynamics of the environment. So, yeah. So, so th this suggests maybe uh, uh, if we create an uh, like Bayesian agent or like any agent that has uh, that learns to predict uh, next states then they may form NTIC. So, so that's something that we are sort of uh, working on uh, these days. So, so to uh, test this idea, so we are now considering this kind of like real, very simple system. So again, like X is the environment. Uh, yeah, maybe it's not again, but, but X is the environment. And then here, Y, is a kind of memory. So, so basically, uh, so X and Y together uh, is uh, goes to this internal state Psi. So, so but this uh, internal state Psi is a hyperparameter of uh, a Bayesian agent. So, so basically, uh, so here we are assuming just uh, X uh, could take one of three states, uh, one, two, or three, and and then this phi here is uh, the uh, a transition matrix from oh, like x1 to x2 or x2 to x3 and so on. So, so basically this psi uh, counts that the current, uh, monitors the current state and how, and, and the previous state. So, so it can count the number of transitions to learn and estimate this phi. And so, and so this is just uh, the definition of NTIC, and then we can compute uh, whether this psi is uh, non-trivially informationally closed from X and Y together. So, and then uh, no, no, if we actually compute for uh, compute NTIC for this system, then uh, we can confirm that uh, the NTIC keeps increasing. So, so, but here we are showing like mutual information and transfer entropy, so mutual information and transfer entropy. Yeah, but, but, but this is uh, about the, uh, the variable level analysis, but, uh, but, but to analyze the impact of uh, uh, individual uh, prediction error, um, we need to uh, use pointwise version of NTIC. And so, so this is a uh, like really like preliminary results uh, uh, done by Martin Bill uh, at Araya. So, but 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 this is the um, the pointwise version 
of our MTIC. And so we are dealing with the same system. And then this is the actual uh, transition probability matrix. And so, and then in this particular, the sequence of one, 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 and then there's some sort of surprising three, and then one, 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 one. Uh, so uh, for when this Bayesian agent encounters like this kind of sequence, uh, okay, so initially like mutual information increases and also NTIC increases, but, but when there's a surprising event three, uh, like, so there's increasing transfer entropy. I, I think this could be uh, seen as a like signature of a prediction error and and the mutual information also increases, but but then uh, this NTIC that briefly drops. So so this is uh, something we expected, and so so. But I think this is a uh, uh, potentially like interesting thing to test experimentally. Um, so so basically, our uh, information closure theory predicts this kind of like brief disruption of consciousness when a uh, prediction error happens. And then the, the, the consciousness restores uh, briefly after. But, but, uh, but this is like, like, you know, based on like really simple uh, uh, sort of numerical experiment. But also, uh, you know, as I said, uh, these are preliminary results because uh, there are actually like many different versions. So here like we are considering single step uh, case and and also like we're using like you know, this particular uh, transition probability matrix so in that sense uh, we still need to do a lot of work but uh, but but we just uh, started observing this kind of expected uh, behavior uh, of the Bayesian agent so that's a uh, oh, kind of exciting okay so um, but I also want to uh, sort of make some conceptual connection to uh, Carl Friston's free energy lemma. So, um, yeah, so, yeah, so this, uh, maybe some of you know the paper called Life as We Know It uh, by Carl Friston. And then in that paper, uh, he presented um, like really interesting uh, like theorem, uh, which says, uh, now, when you have a Markov blanket in a, a dynamical system, then the internal state uh, of the Markov blanket engages with Bayesian inference of the environment. So, so this is potentially like really exciting statement because um, so in a way uh, we wanted to know like what kind of system has an, you know, should, should be considered as modeling the environment. So, so I think uh, if we can approach this kind of question mathematically, I think that's very exciting. But um, but uh, but Martin Bill, uh, Felix Pollock, uh, you know, found potential uh, error in the proof, and so uh, so we uh, wrote a commentary and and why we think uh, uh, this uh, lemma doesn't hold up, and so. But, but the paper is now under review, so we don't know uh, how our arguments are taken. But, uh, but, but our main point is that, uh, so, so there, there's no like real like formal proof of this uh, 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 free energy lemma. And then the crucial point is, this, uh, is that uh, in Friston's proof, uh, this uh, variational density uh, is assumed to exist, and then a lot of discussion assumes that like this, like uh, this model is present. But uh, yeah, but, but from our analysis, uh, probably just uh, having the Markov blanket isn't sufficient or doesn't guarantee that uh, this Q exists. So, so that's uh, our main point. So, so how how do I think uh, this is rated? So. So what I just said is, oh, so a Markov, if Markov blanket implies the Bayesian inference, uh, that would be great, but, 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 but we are not convinced. And so, but in an earlier example, uh, we showed if we have a Bayesian agent, then 
uh, it forms NTIC. But we are thinking if we find an agent that forms an NTIC, then there may be uh, always uh, some sign. It may not be like a base optimal, but but there might be uh, some. Uh, uh, so maybe, so what I want to say is if as we find an NTIC, then uh, the inside of this NTIC may uh, engage with some sort of inference of the environment because that seems to be the like, really necessary. So, so in that sense, maybe uh, well, instead of Markov blanket, NTIC may be the like right kind of a uh, like property to uh, uh, that should be connected with uh, the existence of inference. Yeah, but, but that's um, our current conjecture. Okay, so, so to summarize uh, what I said uh, about information closure theory. So the first point is, uh, so this theory assumes that all conscious experiences arise from the information intrinsic to the system. So, so information closed from, closed from the environment. And, and then the correspondence with the environment comes from the internal dynamics that kind of mimics the dynamics of the environment. So, yeah, and the second point, also NTIC uh, gives us a measure of consciousness uh, that accommodates the paradox I, I mentioned earlier. So, 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 so the pro, no, NTIC process explains why uh, the consciousness is kind of closed from microstate or uh, some the peripheral part of the brain, uh, such as the retina, while it contains uh, the information about the environment. Yeah, so in that sense, uh, I, I feel like uh, uh, this uh, theory uh, can uh, provide a solution to the scale problem and the boundary problem, but also we can use that this measure to find the scale and the core of consciousness uh, inside the brain. Yeah. And the next point is, uh, so Bayesian, so, so we, we are convinced Bayesian agents uh, developed NTIC, but, but, but we haven't shown, but, but we speculate that the reverse is also true. And, and so in that sense, as I said, NTIC may be more suitable so a property that Markov blanket as a signature of cognition. And, and finally, uh, we are very aware of uh, a fundamental limitation of information closure theory, which is the notion of integration. Uh, so so I, I don't know if you know this, but, but the tricky thing is if you take two NTIC process, then uh, we combine two independent NTIC processes, they also form an NTIC. So, so we need to, uh, we haven't like really resolved the boundary problem. So now like every, you know, we can just combine like any uh, a combination of uh, NTIC processes and then create an arbitrary number of consciousness. So, so uh, my consciousness and your consciousness together also forms an NTIC. So that's uh, like a real, uh, problem. So, so in that sense, uh, we feel uh, this theory uh, is uh, not complete, and and so ASA uh, is uh, currently trying to incorporate the ideas from the like, synergy and redundancy to uh, sort of polish the uh, theory. So that's the current status. Okay. So I, yeah, I, I have al already talked for thirty six minutes so so probably i'll try to go over the second half uh, a little bit uh, more quickly so uh but, but this part is uh, a lot of speculations so so that means <laughs> uh, we have time okay um people may complain about this but uh, anyway so but i'll first again uh, uh explain the motivation so so like when, when you watch uh, like science fiction, uh, you know, especially about AI and like uh, things like ex machina and things like that, um, like, like, like really smart AIs uh, in the future, like suddenly become aware and then start having consciousness. And 
So that kind of intuition is very common uh, across lay people, but, but I guess the like professionals, uh, professional like scientists tend to distinguish consciousness and intelligence. But, um, but I kind of try to challenge that notion. So I want to claim consciousness and intelligence are related. And so there's some, something common uh, between them. And, but, but I think this kind of uh, uh, statement is uh, often criticized by uh, people who tend to take epiphenomenalism. So, the con so when we think about uh, subjective experience or qualia, they don't seem to play any role or any causal role uh, on physical system. So, so in that sense, like all the subjective experiences uh, seem to be uh, just ep epiphenomena. But, um, but I think this is like, a, you know, may maybe, you know, the scientists uh, don't like really claim that uh, they, they think uh, like conscious experiences are just epiphenomena. But, but, but I think uh, it's like logically very diff difficult to escape from that kind of viewpoint. But, um, but when we think about functions of consciousness, I think uh, there is a kind of confusion. So the, the first point is that, um, so, so when I ask uh, what is a function of consciousness, uh, people may answer, uh, there's no function because a qualia uh, do not influence uh, our experience, uh, not the, the physical world. But, um, yeah, but, but I guess uh, what I want to ask is slightly different. So when uh, we have consciousness or a conscious animal, what kind of uh, functions do they gain? Or, or when we have, okay, so when we look at some stimulus, like visual stimulus briefly, sometimes they reach conscious perception, sometimes they don't. So, but wh what kind of functional uh, differences does it make whether uh, depending on whether or not you became conscious of that stimulus. So, so what is the functional consequence of having conscious perception? So, so I think so these are slightly different questions. So, so, so the, when I talk about uh, functional consciousness, it's the second kind of question. Okay, so but, but here like I want to just claim that consciousness works as a platform for general intelligence. And, and then I, I try to elaborate my reason, which is, uh, so as I uh, talk later, there are several putative functions of consciousness, and then they seem to uh, serve the purpose of general intelligence. So that's my uh, logic. So, the, but, but first I need to, I want to define uh, what, what is, what general intelligence means. So, so, so I, I constructed this definition. Uh, so, okay, I just read it. So, so generality of intelligence is measured as the ability to uh, efficiently solve multiple tasks, including tasks novel to the agent, uh, using knowledge and models learned through past experiences. So essentially, uh, I'm saying, uh, that, the efficiency of transfer learning or meta learning uh, is the uh, uh, the measure of gen uh, general intelligence, and but of course I'm kind of ignoring other potentially important aspects of intelligence, such as you know, maybe like symbol manipulation and things like that. But I just want to give a some sort of concrete definition of generality so that we can actually uh, measure it, and when also. Uh, in uh, AGI literature, artificial general intelligence literature, uh, sometimes AGI is defined uh, in terms of human level intelligence. But, but, but this definition uh, tends to be a little bit vague because um, you know, we, don't, we don't know what human level actually means. And, and also in the literature of uh, general intelligence, uh, uh, there are many uh, like similar definitions. So, so here I uh, put uh, I quoted uh, from uh, Francois Cholet's uh, recent paper, where he defines intelligence uh, in terms of uh, 
uh, it's a skill acquisition efficiency over a scope of task with respect to prior uh, experience and generalization difficulty. So, so more or less the same kind of definition. So, but yeah, so when we want to define the generality of intelligence, we, uh, we tend to, so it's, it's not about just a collection of uh, solving many uh, tasks, but, uh, but the ability to apply existing knowledge to solve new tasks. So that seems to be uh, one kind of common conception of general intelligence. Okay, so and so we have like uh, we propose three possible ways to uh, build uh, artificial general intelligence. Uh, there may be uh, many other ways, but but these are uh, relatively simple to think about. And also, like in the current AI literature, uh, those methods already exist uh, in some form. So, and, and my claim is that like, each of these uh, possible solutions to uh, general intelligence have sort of relevant theory of consciousness. So that's how I want to connect intelligence and consciousness. So the first point is um, uh, something I call solution by simulation. So once an agent uh, has uh, the so-called forward model, so, so basically a model that predicts the next state given the current state and future action or, or the, the action you are going to take next. Uh, so, so that's called a forward model. And once you have that forward model, you can use it for simulation. So you can think about uh, the counterfactual situations. So, uh, so but this is like, like a really powerful mechanism when we uh, try to solve a new problem. So when you have a forward model of the environment, and then if, if you're given a new task, you can use this kind of like a internal simulation to uh, find a solution to the new problem. So, but of course, you know, you know when, when you have to go to somewhere completely unknown to you, uh, the internal simulation may not work. But, but at least uh, uh, within the environment you, uh, you like learned, uh, you interacted with, uh, you can use internal simulation to uh, solve novel problems. And, and then, so I believe that like, this way of uh, solving new problems is related to uh, something uh, I proposed recently about the functional consciousness, which is uh, information generation hypothesis. So uh, I, I wrote the whole hypothesis here, but uh, the main idea is uh, uh, here is that the functional consciousness is to generate uh, potentially counterfactual uh, information, for example, like imagination is one uh, such example. And, and then, uh, so, so you can use internal models to interact with like events and situations uh, which uh, you haven't experienced. So, so yeah, but I'll explain uh, why I believe in this theory in a minute. One moment. Uh, okay, so, but, but first I, I want to talk about um, world models, uh, uh, which is work done by uh, David Ha and, uh, and Shemit Huber. So, so, so here they um, solved, oops, mm, this, uh, okay. Yeah, so they, they trained a neural network to, uh, sort of encode like this kind of visual input, and so so typically like you know in, uh, you can use something like variational autoencoder to encode like this kind of state uh, to low dimensional space, and then uh, then uh, you have an additional recurrent neural network to learn the dynamics. So so basically this corresponds to the forward model I mentioned. So you, know, you have a compressed representation of the environment, and then 
uh, through this recurrent neural network, you learn uh, how the next state uh, change, how the state changes next, uh, depending on your action. So, yeah. So, so you know, with these two, you learn the dynamics of the environment. But once you have this kind of dynamics, then uh, you can basically run sort of mental simulation just using this, and then uh, try to find a good policy to solve the problem. So, so what's impressive about their work is that uh, first uh, their AI agent learned this kind of dynamics, and then uh, later, uh, so, so this is uh, basically, uh, this agent is playing these games uh, in their head, and then try to come up with a solution. So, so yeah, so, so this is one like uh, AI instantiation of uh, world models. Yeah, but, but the great thing about this is uh, if you are given a new task, you can use this kind of mental simulation to uh, uh, play well to achieve a different goal. So you can rerun this kind of training using your uh, internal simulation. And yeah, but, but there are many like ways to sort of extend this kind of approach. And but on the other hand, um, uh, so from here, I want to sort of uh, give you the reason why I believe uh, a potential function of consciousness is to uh, perform uh, mental simulation or to internally generate representations using uh, internal models. So, uh, so here I want to uh, give you two examples uh, of uh, cognitive functions that require consciousness. So, so one is called uh, trace conditioning. So, so basically, uh, so in classical conditioning, so for example, uh, I bring conditioning. So you first hear a beep, and then there will be a air path to your eyelid. And so once you learn this association, like you start blinking just in response to the beep. So, so that's uh, classical conditioning, but, but there are two types of uh, sort of temporal so sequences, one is called delay conditioning, where you have this CS, uh, oh, in this case beep, and then air path US. So if they temporarily overlap, regardless of whether the subject is aware or unaware of the contingency, they can just learn. So, so this classical condition, conditioning is, not, uh, uh, is independent of awareness. But when there's a temporal gap between this beep and uh, like air path, uh, only subject who became aware of this temporal contingency learned to blink in response to the beep. So, so it seems uh, we need consciousness to sort of bridge the temporal gap and then connect the information. So, but so here, uh, so this information uh, of the beep needs to be somehow maintained over time. So, so this uh, is one uh, potential uh, function that depends on consciousness. And another example comes from uh, a patient study uh, of a, a patient who has uh, form agnosia. Uh, so that, uh, that's the inability to see uh, shapes uh, because of brain damage to uh, occipital, uh, like probably like lateral occipital cortex. And so the interesting thing is, uh, so you know, when this patient uh, uh, lost the ability to see shapes, uh, she couldn't report the orientation of a slit. Uh, so yeah, so when she uh, looks at uh, a slit, uh, then she couldn't uh, so report uh, the orientation of the slit. Uh, consciously, but, but if she's asked to sort of post an envelope through the slit, then she could do it. So, so that means uh, when the, the sort of target of action is visually available online, then uh, she could use that information unconsciously. Um, so, so in that sense, like uh, this kind of visually guided behavior doesn't uh, require conscious experience or conscious perception uh, of the orientation. But the interesting uh, thing about uh, this study was uh, if she first sees the slit and then the 
then the lights turned off. And then after three seconds, uh, she was asked to post it. Then she couldn't do it. So that means, so th there seems to be a, uh, again, like so some sort of connection between uh, sort of carrying information over a temporal gap and consciousness. So if, um, yeah, so here, so lack of awareness uh, led to the, uh, the difficulty in sort of using that information over time so that uh, well so that she can uh, wait yeah yeah so 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 in a way uh, so with these examples uh, consciousness seems to be particularly important when you need to interact with information that's no longer present uh, like real time so in a way it you no know, Maybe it could be something like short-term memory, but but I don't know if uh, people all agree that short-term memory uh, is the sign of consciousness. Well, no, there are a few studies that showed uh, a possibility of unconscious working memory. So it's a kind of controversial field. Yeah, yeah, but but but, but based on like the, well, this kind of findings, uh, I I claim that the ability to generate representational events. Uh, disconnected from the prevent, uh, present environment is the uh, function consciousness. But, but to do that, you know, that we need to first learn the model of the world, and then uh, maybe you know that kind of model is learned through uh, the sensory model contingency uh, experience through interaction uh, with the world. But but once we have that kind of uh, model we can use it to uh, simulate the world so uh, so in this sense we can also explain like intention and planning or imagination so for example you know when we intend to make some action uh, we don't uh, no, we use our internal model uh, to sort of predict what kind of sens sensation we would receive by uh, like if we you know if we were to make a particular action so so intention could be already uh, thought of as some sort of like a like generated representation of future events and also like the you no know, consciousness is all uh, connected with non-reflexive behavior so so for non-reflexive behavior you now we first take some stimulus in but uh but but the uh, action is not directly triggered by the sensory input but but the information is used and then then later acted on uh, by the agent so in that sense but we need some sort of like short-term memory to perform non-reflexive behavior so but that then again uh, this is enabled by the ability to uh, sort of represent information of uh, using internal models and so again, but my, my short-term memory is you know, something obvious. Yeah. So, but um, but in terms of um, actual neural architecture, uh, what does it mean to generate information? So, for example, uh, when we consider autoencoder type of thing, uh, so typically, okay, so uh, you use images as input, and then. No, you want to reconstruct the image as an output, but through uh, this kind of narrow bottleneck. And, and usually all the encoders are separated into encoder and decoder. And, and here, uh, information generation, what I'm talking about, corresponds to this decoder part. So, so you put some image or, or some like seed uh, representation here, and then you can generate uh, like, or maybe many types of cats, you know, if you have a, a good auto encoder for cats. And, but, but inside the brain, uh, uh, we have like similar mechanism. Uh, so in predictive coding, uh, this kind of encoder would be sort of bottom-up inputs, that uh, feed forward bottom-up inputs. And then the information is compressed. So in the higher areas in the brain or in the visual cortex, uh, we have more compact, more abstract representations, but but the feedback part corresponds to this decoder. So, so so we 
so we when we use this kind of like feedback network we can use it as for uh, generating new images or imaging things so so here uh, uh, based on this information generation hypothesis uh, we are claiming that uh, this feedback process is particularly important for uh, generating consciousness and uh, so but this view is compatible with uh, like a, some like physiological studies but here uh, uh, well maybe uh, for the sake of time I, I'm not going into details but but there are uh, several like physiological studies suggesting that uh, whether we become conscious or not depends on the presence of successful feedback signals uh, coming from higher areas to lower visual areas okay how am I doing on time? Um, okay, I have two more things. Um, okay, so since, how, yeah, what should I do? Um, how, how, what's, okay, okay. Okay, all right, good, good. Um, yeah, so I'll, yeah, I have two more things to say, but I'll try to be brief. So for the second way of uh, building AGI, uh, we can use combination. So if we have task specific models, uh, we can combine them to solve a new task. And I think this is related to uh, the concept of global work theory, uh, but, but maybe with some modification. Yeah, so, so you know, first uh, we can, uh, let's say we have like many neural networks so this could be artificial neural networks, or but this could be actual human brain. Uh, but but the idea is like so. For example, you no, know, for typical neural network, you put something like an image of a cat, and then you get the label. But uh, but that's just one function. But but there are many things. So for example, like you know, you you could also uh, create a neural network that distinguishes like different kind of animals based on the sound they make. Or uh, you no, know, we could have uh, like a you no know, word a translator from English words to Japanese, or we can also create some sort of speech generator. So, so every you know, every arrow here is a function or neural network. And but uh, but but if you have like all of these arrows, you can construct a new network from image to well, let's say, okay. You, know, you combine this arrow from like image to words and then from words to you know, what kind of tactile sensation you'd get so so then okay so you can also construct a new function from image to this like, tactile representation so that way when you have like many uh, uh, neural networks you can solve a new problem just by connecting them properly so that's the uh, second idea and then uh, there's something called a path net which is conceptually relevant in this context. And I'm not sure if this is like very successful because I haven't seen like many like follow-up studies along this line, but, but, but this is kind of relevant. And so, but, but I think uh, in, uh, in global workspace theory, uh, the idea is like you have uh, specialized networks, but, but then uh, in the uh, oh, global workspace, uh, the output of specialized uh, networks uh, can be broadcasted and then used for other purposes. So, so that's the gist of global workspace theory. And but but to uh, make this global workspace theory uh, work for uh, neural networks, uh, so as I said, uh, uh, these neural networks uh, compress information, but uh, but to make this kind of a uh, compressed representation useful for other networks. These all these uh, latent representations need to have some sort of common ground, common uh, language. So, so, so the 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 way I'm thinking of extending global workspace is to think that uh, global workspace as a shared latent space, so that uh, the different specialized neural networks can communicate with each other. So once we have this kind of like a common space, then uh, we can use like many different networks in a flexible manner to solve new problems. 
Yeah, and and then uh, the inside the brain, uh, you know, of course there are like many different regions, but uh, but but apparently uh, what's very different about the brain from a typical AI neural networks is that like there are so many paths, and and then inside the brain, uh, depending on the task, uh, like there seems to be some sort of rerouting uh, across different regions. So so I'm here. I'm just showing uh, one paper by uh, Salman where they showed uh, like alpha wave uh, is used as a way to like channel uh, communication between different. Uh, brain regions, and uh, in, in this case, uh, that seems to be controlled by the brain region called the parvinar. So, so this is like uh, the schematics uh, I get from this. So, so the idea is uh, inside the cortex, you have like many, many neural networks, but, but to solve a new problem, we want to find the right way to combine existing neural networks. And then this kind of uh, sort of like directing or combining uh, existing networks may be uh, done by the thalamus, and then uh, the, then but, but this kind of combination, you know, what kind of combination needs to be created uh, needs to be uh, uh, somehow instructed by the representation of goals. I don't know. I just put DLPFC, but but maybe like some area in the prefrontal cortex may uh, sort of you no. Know, have the ability to uh, find the right combination of neural networks given the task. So that that's the um, you know, that's how I kind of imagine uh, like hum how the human brain uh, solves general problems. Okay, so this is the same stuff. Okay, so finally the last point. So uh, okay, so so this is like uh, the third way of uh, solving. Uh, uh, general AI problem. So this is a, a little bit tricky concept. So I'll, yeah, let me, mm, okay. Yeah, I, I try to find a way to explain this quickly. Um, okay. Okay, so how do I explain this? Yeah, so here uh, I first want to say uh, if we can embed neural networks uh, in a latent space, then uh, well, we can like use it for like generating new neural networks. Maybe you know this idea sounds a, a little bit complicated, but uh, okay, maybe uh, okay. So this is how I think about this. So. Okay, so each of these like arrows indicate one neural network. So, so maybe this uh, neural network is about object recognition, this uh, neural network is about face recognition, but, uh, but we can use another neural network to embed these networks to, uh, here I call qualia space, but, but basically you can embed functions to a common space. And then uh, once you have a representation of neural networks, so here, like each point is a neural network. And so you can sort of talk about the similarity between different neural networks, or so, so for example, like, you know, uh, like maybe like object recognition and face recognition may be similar, but, but it would be very different from like speech recognition. So, so and then this uh, like space itself must have some sort of, uh, like structure, and also uh, now if this has like encoder decoder kind of structure, then you know, in principle you should be able to generate new neural networks. I'm not sure if humans do that, but uh, but 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 uh, but in AI uh, research, it's becoming possible to generate neural networks to solve uh, new problems. So you know, in the context of meta learning, and but the reason why I'm connecting this to Qualia is um okay yeah so let me explain uh this so so what i want to do is uh okay so let's say uh i have like red detector or uh, like various color detectors so they should create uh, they should have some sort of like a topological structure uh in this qualia space so 
So usually, like when we talk about qualia like, uh, or redness of red, uh, uh, we always think about why activation in a, a particular neural network corresponds to some experience. But, but here, what I'm claiming is if we want to talk about the, the qualitative aspect of sort of detecting red in the scene, then uh, we need to have this kind of uh, meta representation. So, so that's, uh, yeah, so, so then we can talk, no, here like similar colors would be close to each other. And yeah, so if we want to talk about the quality of something, then uh, yeah, instead of uh, just looking at this network, we need to have this kind of meta representation. And also uh, like this idea was motivated by uh, sort of a lack of clarity in uh, the higher order uh, theories of consciousness. So, so for example, uh, we often sort of, yeah, uh, you know, some people think we need higher order representation to have consciousness, but, but it's always uh, very unclear what it means to have some sort of meta representation. So, so for example, yeah, let's say you have some neural network from A to B, so it transforms input A to some other some other representation B, but then you can also uh, transform B to another representation C. But but can we say C is a meta representation of A? But but that's probably not true because now C is again representation of A. So. And also, so, so that approach doesn't work. And then another uh, approach that doesn't work is uh, confidence. So we talk about, uh, or like in human experiment, we often use confidence as a, some sort of a signature metacognition. So we often ask subjects whether they can, you know, they are confident about their report of seeing some stimulus. And, but, uh, but when, uh, but, but in, uh, AI image recognition, uh, it, you always see uh, the confidence. So, uh, so uh, usually, like in the like final, like softmax layer, well, you know, you can interpret uh, softmax as probability, and then you know you can call them uh, confidence. But but then, uh, if like you know, it's just uh, like one like simple additional manipulation, uh, and so just having that. Uh, doesn't seem to be sufficiently me like meta. So, so I have been thinking what it means to have a meta representation. And so, but, but this is my sort of tentative answer. So if you, so, so, so here we have a meta representation of a neural network. So, so neural network is a process or a function, but, but then once you, you, you kind of, uh, transform into some embedding space, then uh, you can make the process uh, into an object. And, and then uh, you can use like sort of like compare different networks and things like that. But, 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 but that's uh, maybe like towards the end, I, I kind of rushed a bit. So maybe some things might be a bit unclear. Yeah. Um, Okay, so yeah, this is what I already said. Okay, so okay, maybe like I, I was a bit messy towards the end, so I just want to give you a concise take-home messages. So, so here I I wanted to uh, sort of explain the three possible ways to build uh, AGI, and and then my claim is that uh, they have some connections to. Uh, theories of consciousness, especially about possible functions of consciousness, and and I I'm I'm interested in this approach because uh, when we talk about theories of consciousness, uh, uh, things like global workspace or uh, meta representation, it's often unclear what they mean uh, computationally. But but when we take this kind of more AI perspective, we can think about how, what, what it means to implement global workspace or what it means to uh, 
uh, create meta representation. So, so of course, you know, uh, I'm not completely sure the way I'm thinking how I can implement those things uh, completely correspond to what the, uh, the people who propose those theories thought about. But, but, but I think at least, you know, some attempts uh, should be done to make those sort of conceptual models uh, clearer um, and then sort of thinking about implement, uh, implementing those functions uh, would help us uh, be more sort of uh, concrete about a kind of corresponding mathematical concept. Yeah, and so, yeah, so my, my final conclusion is uh, there might be uh, some link between consciousness and intelligence. Of course, you know, as I warned earlier, like, you know, uh, this is highly speculative, but, but I think uh, I want to encourage more people to think about uh, potential functions of consciousness. And I think a lot of times uh, people are discouraged from thinking about functions of consciousness because you know, they confuse uh, the two questions I mentioned earlier. Okay, yeah, so I guess that's all and thank you very much.